Hola, welcome everyone to the afternoon sessions. Uh, today we have now um, David Daza, who is going to present data architectures in the cloud for strengthening democracy. Um, please, uh, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, how many of you speak English? Ooh, full room, shit. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so hi everyone, my name is David. I today will be talking about data architectures in the cloud for strengthening democracy. I work at DataSketch. Uh, we are a civic tech company organization. Uh, that's my email if you ever want to reach out. First, I will be talking about data projects followed by data architectures. A big small data, maybe that's a new term for some of you. Our experiences building stuff, and I will attempt to talk about the future. So, what exactly is a data project? Everybody knows. Ah. Okay. So, at its core, a data project is taking raw data and doing something valuable with it. Uh, you can call it. I mean, one could analyze data to surface insights or you could build a data product or a data service, or you could use it to train a machine learning model. Uh, that all sounds pretty easy, but the reality is that to start, you have to move a whole bunch of pieces, and this is what a data project looks like, yeah? And this is the hell that you find when you're trying to accomplish to glue like all of those pieces together. That's when a data architecture uh, comes into play because, I mean, when you want to start a data project, you first have to know uh, which, which uh, data of your, are you working with. Sorry, let me just close this. Pretty annoying. Yeah, uh, you have to work with files, with data, and, but then you don't know what data you have. You can have databases, files, external providers, etc. cetera. Uh, once you get a handle on where the data is coming from, you have to uh, figure out how to collect the data. And then if you collect the data, you are facing uh, fighting perhaps with multiple Multiple, yeah, multiple systems with different quota limits, different file formats, different APIs, uh, different uh, permissions for their, their APIs and so on. And then when you have all these raw data, you will have to, you need computing power to start processing the data, to start transforming the data. And that's where a data architecture comes into play. Because the architecture is more like the strategy that you will use to glue all those pieces together and get the result you want. Another way to see or to, yeah, to think about data architectures is like this, like the roadmap for your data entire, entire journey, like from the initial collecting through all the reshaping and transforming, how you distribute the data, and ultimately how it gets used and consumed by whoever you want. Um, and also, uh, then you have to think about how is all the flow that your data is taking through all the storage and processing infra? I will say infra instead of infrastructure because that's art. And also ingest in instead of ingestion because I don't know how to say that word as well. This one here is a pattern in data architecture called layer data architecture. Um, it's layer because each one of those pieces, you know, collecting, transforming, storage, and, and stuff, becomes a layer into this architecture and is decoupled from one another. So you can work on the ingest uh, layer without touching the storage layer, allegedly. Uh, but it's easier, I mean. Uh, and since they are decoupled one from another, you can make changes on one layer and then it won't impact greatly on other parts of the architecture. 
So the ingest, the ingest uh, layer, it's pretty easy to think about. I, it's pretty easy to think about. This is the stage where, or the layer, where you take all the data sources and store them in some place, basically like in a format, in a raw data. The processing layer is when you take all, all the data that is already in some where in the world, you process the data, you transform. Transform data means cleaning data, analyzing data, normalizing data, maybe do some data enrichment. Then you store that processed information, and then you can uh, like consume that data via dashboard, uh, report, even an API for, for our system to, to use that data for you. Then you can plug and play with all this. So for the ingest part, you can use something like Airbyte. This is like, this is the technology, and you can use that for ingest or Apache Spark maybe. For the storage, raw data, Amazon S3. Uh, process data, maybe something like Snowflake uh, for processing, something like DBT, I don't know. You have like a lot of options. Uh, however, this requires some technical knowledge. Uh, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that this is expensive actually, but it does require some technical knowledge. And the reality is that some organizations or some individuals maybe do not have like the budget or the time to learn all of these technologies or to hire someone that knows how to cope with this. Enter big small data, handcraft data sets. Big small data is a term we use at the company that refers to a lot of small data that is pretty valuable by itself, but there is also small data that becomes valuable where it interoperates with data that come from multiple sources that are, that are scattered and siloed. Now I will share some of our experiences working with big small data. La Silla Vacía, the MT Share, is a digital media outlet in Colombia, and for last year, they created with us, this website. And uh, this website is based in one spreadsheet that contains all of the information of candidates for the 2023 Colombian regional elections. These are governors, mayors, and all of those people. Question Publica, another digital media outlet from Colombia. They have more data sets, but again, there were only spreadsheets, nothing too fancy. They created, they created like this, we created with them like this game of votes kind of a report. And then you can know with this, uh, you can read about the, the different political houses in Colombia. That, yeah, like their influences, public businesses and stuff. For the first project, this was the data architecture. Yeah, that's the image. I told you, a single spreadsheet in Google Sheets this logo that says ingest and transform is the logo from Google Apps Script, which is like a technology that Google enables to, for us, so we can connect to their different Google services. And you may see that, for example, for the single spreadsheet, data source and storage are like the same layer because you cannot decouple the data source and the storage in Google Sheets. It's the same thing. The Google Apps Script is I will show you how this works. Uh, the Google Apps script is just the ingest and transform stage. And then this exposes an API that we use in GitHub. And GitHub, like in that time, every night or, or, or so, uh, call that API and build a website, which is the website that they use to share their findings. This is the architecture for the second project that, that, uh, that I showed you. Uh, there were like a lot of spreadsheet, different spreadsheet. Each spreadsheet was for a different political house, and there, there, there was like this main spreadsheet that was like, hey, this is the political house number one, this is the spreadsheet for them, this is their logo, whatever. Same architecture, I miss an arrow down there, but it is the same. And for this, if you want to take a Google Apps script and take the data from a spreadsheet, this is all you need. I don't know why I don't see my image right here, but okay. This is all you need. 28 lines of code, you can scan this and you'll get the code. Uh, that's pretty easy. Wow, okay. 
Mexico City opened their portal. Um, there are like a lot of government companies in, in Mexico City, and they give their data to this digital agency for public innovation, and they are uploading this to the open data portal of the, of the Mexico City. It was built with SICAN. Uh, they, the ADIP, Digital Innovation Agent Policy, they are the ones that ingest the data because they, like, literally, they, they, the government, they hand out the data to the, to, to the ADIP. They transform the data into a format, uh, like a SICAN friendly format. SICAN is the load and consumption, storage is in Postgres because SICAN depends on Postgres, and then we use Shiny uh, to report and to make some beautiful dashboards with data of the Mexico City. I have five minutes left, so I am running. Public Procurement Observatory, this project was done with Ecuador, and basically, this is to identify red flags in public, pro public pro procurement, sorry. This API was made by another company, I don't know, but they read the data from the OCDS, and then what we do is analytics and ranking in our databases, and then shine it for reporting dashboard, and then a website you can, where you can see the, the ranking as a table. Uganda, same thing. How are people elected in Uganda? Or how were elected in Uganda? The Electoral Commission of Uganda recovers the data. They hand out that data to IRI, and they uploaded, I don't know why, to Google Cloud Storage. And they were like, hey, we have this in Google Cloud Storage, do something with it. We did it with a single JavaScript file. We don't need much more than that. And then we have the, the consumption in the web. ADI, this is in progress, actually. We, we are not done with this project yet. But it's more like Ecuador. It's red flags in public procurement uh, in five countries of the Balkans, Turkey, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Serbia, and Bosnia. And this is how we are dealing with this. These are the public op open data portals of those countries. We're using Puppeteer to scrap, to scrape all the data. We are storing in DocDB, an eye on DocDB, it's the future. We are transforming with R, and then we are uh, restoring that uh, transform data in DocDB. So this is my hot take. There is no one size fits all for data architectures. And since this is hot, a hot take, in our experience, there is no one size fits all for their architectures. We have some challenges. There are change in culture because one thing that is important is metadata. So if people are like uh, filling data sets by hand and we don't have a metadata, it will be very difficult for us to then know what that data is about. Same thing when cataloging. If you know, if me, if I am collecting, I don't know, 30 data sets and I don't. I'm, I am not cataloging that data set, then in five months, I wouldn't know what that what data set is about, what. And fact checking is very prone error if you build the data set by hand. Uh, so there must be a, a process of, of fact checking that, yeah, it's pretty hard. Boy. The future, that image doesn't go there, but the future, more like the present, is thinking data architectures that enables AI-powered uh, stuff. So we made, a, we made a demo. This is chatbot. We'll call it chatbot because it gives you not only answers in natural language, but also maps and table. And this chatbot is all based in a single spreadsheet, again, with the results of the US elections. And thank you. I think I made it, yeah. Precise. Thank you so much. Uh, we have five minutes for uh, questions. Do you have? Just raise your hand. Claro, alguna pregunta igual en español también se valen. Thank you. Thank you. What? What were there things that led you to? choose different architectures for these different projects? Like, were there things that were like, this obviously doesn't make sense. This architecture wouldn't make sense here because of whatever. Basically, we have clients that they want to iterate really fast. And 
usually we don't have the time to tell them, okay, you have your data in Google Spreadsheet, for example, and that's fine, but not quite, so let's move on to this one. And since, I mean, we have to work with what they have. We offer solutions for what their current status quo, if you say. So that's why we are like creating like a lot of strategies to, to deal with this. In your initial overview of data architectures, you had a layer for governance and policy. Um, do you provide any support in that area as well? Yeah, that's a pretty gray area uh, because security is rather easy in the sense that I mean, we, we can keep all of our data or their customers' data private and stuff. But sometimes they want access to, that, to, to the data we have transformed. Uh, that's okay, uh, but sometimes they mess with the data. It's like, hey, my website is down. It's like, but you change the data. So don't mess with me. Um, and the governance is one of the challenges I, I talk about. I mean, cataloging the data sets, uh, that's one of the challenges. That, that's a challenge because it depends on a change of culture. So, I mean, it is a thing, it, it is not like quite strong in our process right now, but, but we are working on it. Um, I have a question. So, obviously I've done projects like this before, and quite often I've been getting a lot of, we'd love to move away from Google Sheets to like Airtable. Have you had to work with Airtable, and do you have one that you prefer over the other? Yeah, we have work with, Air, with Airtable. Um, in fact, we have like our website, Data Sketch. If you go to datasketch.co slash solutions slash portfolio, the data you will find there is actually in our table. So, but it's the same thing. It's another source and you connect via API. It's rather easier table because you have like an actual API to deal with. Instead with Google Sheets, you will have to, I mean, I have to take the script, give that to the spreadsheet owner, and in a video call say like, hey, uh, open Google Apps script, paste this right here. Implement this. So I prefer Airtable over Google Sheets. Yeah. And I think that's one of my favorites right now.